I cast the first panel as, as folks from the public sector looking into the private sector and thinking about how to create a set of institutions and frameworks and incentives that might lead to a more secure cyber country. Uh, we now turn to a second panel, which is uh, a set of panelists from the private sector that will be looking at the issue of cybersecurity and the role that the public sector might play in terms of facilitating, promoting, and encouraging uh, cybersecurity in a way that is economically efficient and, and robust. Uh, to moderate the panel today, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Scott Walston, who is uh, one of the senior policy scholars at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. He's also the vice president for research for the Technology Policy Institute uh, and a frequent uh, contributor to the economic journals and uh, in the technology space. So Scott will moderate the panel. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so my role here is basically to keep the trains running. Uh, so, uh, and I'll also follow John. I'm always happy to follow John's lead to not do something. Um, so I also won't introduce the panelists, uh, but I expect you all to read their, um, to read their bios because it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very impressive group. Um, and uh, so we'll have the, uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of the, the private sector side and also more of the, some of the research side. Um, so let's, uh, let's start with, with David, David Betts. Well, thanks very much. So I'm Dave Botts with Edison Electric Institute. Uh, I'd like to first thank uh, Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies and, and the Center for Business and Public Policy. I think these, these topics are, are very important to discuss. And moreover, I'm glad that, that it's, it's the issue is not being filibustered by, say, uh, academia or government or private industry, but, but instead there's a recognition that, that, frankly, there is a partnership and, and we all need to work together to achieve solutions to make sense. Uh, a little bit about EEI. Edison Electric Institute is the trade association of investor-owned utilities. Our members are responsible for about 70% of the electricity that is generated, transmitted, or distributed in the United States. Um, so I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about incentives. And I wanted to just highlight that electric utilities right now today, today, are highly incented to run cyber secure infrastructures. Um, right now today, uh, utilities are already subject to a very broad suite of mandatory enforceable uh, standards that come with penalties that are somewhat attention getting, I think, uh, penalties up to $1 million per day per violation. And so uh, I appreciate uh, Deputy Undersecretary uh, Shank's uh, proposition that, that compliance is not equal security. I strongly agree with that. Um, and yet, compliance is a, is a business liability reality that, that uh, my companies have to, have to deal with. Um, so, so there, there are federal regulations, and in addition, there are a number of, of state and local regulations, including uh, uh, regulations re regarding reliability to customers. Um, in addition, uh, particularly for the investor-owned utilities, we have to recognize that there are also built-in incentives um, called income and revenue drivers. Um, if the meters are not spinning, then, then the money is not coming in the front door, and that causes <coughs> investors to become very unhappy. Um, as it relates to incentives, one of the, one of the major areas of, of interest for, for our members is liability protection. Uh, we would recognize that, that the, the framework in and of itself probably, and, and DHS, probably does not have the ability to um, create, a, create liability protection for companies that adhere to it. Um, we're very interested in, in information sharing, very interested in working with the government and, ex and the exchange of information. And yet, um, our interest, un unfortunately, in today's world is somewhat tempered by the fact that there may be liability issues that we, we have to take into account. So we would, we would really look to, to Congress um, soon or at some point to, to put into place a, a, a way for information sharing to happen without uh, creating additional liability. 
With respect to information sharing and, and the notion of prioritized technical assistance, um, we think that, that it's, it's perhaps a little bit challenging to, uh, to create a framework that says, well, uh, entities who, who employ or adopt the framework are now qualified to receive additional new breaking information uh, or, or to enjoy uh, full information sharing. We're, we're a little bit concerned that it, that might create, um, it might create possibly a chicken and an egg scenario whereby companies might not employ the framework because they are not receiving the information that they should be receiving to actually know and understand that they should be employing the framework. So, so rather than having that conversation, let's, let's try and move forward uh, fully and rapidly with effective information sharing regimens. Um, as to cybersecurity insurance, we'd be very interested in additional progress being made in this space, in particular to look at having the federal government provide somewhat of a, of a backstop uh, for insurance for, for the insurers and reinsurers, um, in particular for, for high impact, low frequency events um, to help everybody understand what is their liability, what is, what is the exposure, to the degree that we can have a better understanding of, of the investment and, and, and what are the sort of the outer bounds of exposure, we can have a reasoned, a reasoned and informed discussion about, okay, what makes sense in terms of implementing certain specific discrete technology procedures, et cetera, all of which that have a cost. So if we can have a better informed discussion about um, options for insurance and limitations on exposure, we'll be, we'll be better able to make financially driven decisions. Uh, that are in fact demanded by the Security and Exchange Commission and our investors. Um, other incentives, we would welcome the notion of additional research uh, being made into the space of measurement of cybersecurity, which is, is, is a hard area to measure effectively. Finally, with respect to pro uh, procurement, um, uh, I, I reviewed the, the DHS report. Um, specifically, there's, there's a discussion about um, certain, certain requirements for procurement. I guess my, the only thing I would say is we want to be careful about unintended consequences. We don't want to create a situation where uh, entities who want to do the right thing cannot acquire certain products because they may not meet certain um, certain specifications, and at the same time, um, incentives or initiatives related to procurement should be brought in alignment with other ongoing and pre-existing uh, procurement efforts. So specifically, DHS is also working separately on another procurement area uh, for, for the security. Uh, it's the RFP language for secure um, industrial control systems. So it'd be great for all of these things to be working together and in alignment. So those are my brief comments. Okay. Um, let's go to oh, Sasha. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, John, for the invitation uh, to, um, to come and talk to you. I have a few comments. Uh, first of all, I guess I wanted to thank, or at least uh, you know, tip my hat to DHS and Commerce and Treasury and and NIST for um, for producing the documents they did. I mean, that's quite a that's quite a challenge to address an, an unstructured problem and, and to produce those documents. So that that's great. Um, and it was also nice to see in the DHS document a you know a good uh, economic approach to to addressing the problem. The, so the discussion of marginal benefits and marginal costs is uh, is, is is familiar and, and appreciated because I think it really addresses the topic of efficiency, right? I mean, who who is against waste? Right? No, nobody wants to spend more than they need to. Which leads me to the, you know, the, the first question I want to I bring up, that before 
you know, maybe we, we want to talk, we want to jump right in into trying to figure out how to get companies to, you know, adopt this framework and, and adopt more security, that maybe we should step back and ask, well, how do we know they're not already investing enough? Right? How do we know they're not already investing the, uh, uh, the efficient, investing in the efficient amount of security? And it's not clear to me that really any of us know that they're not. Um, many people might suggest that, well, they're not because look at all the data breaches that happen. Look at all the intellectual property that is stolen. That's not really a good answer, right? Because uh, given the example before here in the previous panel of the, of the mattress, we could think of, you know, you can, you can create a mattress that is, you know, is, um, uh, is, is inflammable, right? That under the best circumstances or the worst circumstances will never light on fire. You could also design a mattress that will, that will light up right away. So the question is, at what point, how, how flame-proof do you want to design this mattress? Well, that's kind of analogous to, I think, what we're addressing here. We don't necessarily want to force companies to invest in more security than they need to, just like we don't want to design a mattress or force a mattress to be created that is more fireproof than it needs to be. So I think it's worthwhile asking the question, and, and I appreciate that it's a difficult question uh, to actually answer, but I think it's worth, I think it's worth addressing. Um, now, one way, may, one way we might go about that is to understand the costs that are imposed on people, these externalities that are imposed on others because of firm actions. So if it's true that the firm is bearing all of the costs of its actions, then we might say that it's operating at a deficient level. So it seems reasonable then to try and look at the costs that are imposed on others because of firm actions. Now, it's possible that we could uncover these costs. We could understand when firms are not bearing uh, the full cost of their actions, but I think those should be enumerated at least, um, and that would that would at least help understand the context of how much more uh, firms should invest in different kinds of, of controls. And to the extent that we're talking about privacy and consumers and 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 otherwise and and other say, actors in this ecosystem, there may be a burden on them as well to protect their information, to protect their assets, whether this relates to suppliers or partners or whatever, um, I think there's a responsibility on, on all of the actors to, um, to behave in an efficient manner. Now, that's not to say that, that issues of equity and fairness aren't also relevant, so because in that analysis, one may, you know, one may, one may come up with a solution that's, that suggests that firms should bear uh, all of the cost, but or consumers should bear all of the cost, but, but maybe that's not quite uh, uh, an equitable solution that we want. So I appreciate that those are, are two different forces that, that we should balance. Um, what I really what I really uh, get very excited about, if in regard to one of the the incentives that it, that is brought up, is cyber insurance. So uh, in, the, in the DHS reports, the Commerce reports, and in NIST, they talk about, you know, we want to adopt sort of these, you know, this different framework, these different kinds of technologies, not being specific, of course. Uh, but there is an underlying assumption that something will be adopted that will improve uh, the security posture of a company. But really no one is, is able yet to describe what those security controls really would be. Do we need more detection controls? Do we need more recovery controls? Uh, or corrective controls, uh, and and I think it's useful to have that conversation. And so, rather than just posing very difficult questions, I might provide a solution. And I think the solution to the question of what security controls really matter lies with cyber insurance. So um, it turns out that you know the, the the people in the best position to to answer that are those. Uh, who see these costs, who see these security events, and need to pay out money. So the carriers, the reinsurers, and the brokers. So what they have is a list of all of the policies that, uh, that they write, uh, and an outcome of has a claim been filed against that policy, yes or no, the amount of, of money that, the, that the, um, the company is claiming for damages, and a list of a vector of security controls that the company has implemented based on their self-evaluation forms that they provided to the insurance company when they got the policy. From that work, you can picture in your mind this table, we can do some straight up uh, econometric analysis to identify the different kinds of controls 
that lead or that are predictive of a claim being filed. Not only that, we can determine how much more effective they are. And, and so these issues that, that many have raised of, well, the insur cyber insurance market is not, um, is not well developed and there aren't enough data available to do this analysis, I just, I just, don't, I just don't buy. They've been writing these policies for over a decade now. There are a list of, you know, I can give you a list of almost a dozen or so companies that are providing these policies already. And they're all very similar in terms of third party, first party losses that they cover, third party losses that they cover. So uh, lawsuits um, brought by consumers, say in the event of a data breach, um, <laughs> regulatory fines, whether it's a network incident, a, a security breach, loss of business, all of this stuff is, is very well covered and I think very well, very well defined. Um, but I think, I think it provides a wonderful opportunity to actually get at the question that I think a lot of us are really trying to ask, what security controls matter? And I really believe that it's a win-win for everyone. The insurance companies then become better able to assess the risk, the proper risk of, of, of any client. The, um, the clients themselves, the firms, then enjoy uh, lower premiums for adopting the kinds of controls that really do matter. And overall, we have a um, you know, critical infrastructure and industry that enjoys lower risk. Uh, so I think it's a really great opportunity. Now what this takes, of course, is participation by the insurance companies, by the carriers. Uh, to, to, you know, sh to share their data with, I don't know, maybe a researcher who's very <laughs> interested in doing this work or some other organization who can, who can do the work. But I think it's a very answerable kind of question. Um, thank you. Um, and also I would like to thank Georgetown University and, and uh, you, Joan, for inviting me and UTC here today. Let me just tell you a little bit about U Utilities Telecom Council so that you understand our perspective. The utilities, the focus of, of UTC um, is the communications network capabilities that underlie all of our essential public services. Um, those network capabilities and the, and the communications networks that are designed, built, and maintained by the, the critical infrastructure owners themselves, by electric companies, by gas companies, by water companies. We also represent not only IOUs, but also the smaller municipals and cooperatives. So uh, that are, that are ele electric companies, as well as gas companies, as well as water companies. So we are truly a cross-sector type of organization, but we are laser focused on the communications aspect um, of the convergence of IT, operations technology, and communications technology, better known as smart grid or grid modernization or eventually modernization of all of our essential public services. So we have a little bit broader perspective and we represent not only the big guys but the small guys and also natural gas pipelines are part of our membership. Um, so the diversity of, of the utility industry really means that there are different drivers depending on the type of entity that you have, whether you're an IOU, um, whether you're a co-op or whether you're a municipal, you have different drivers that are going to be causing you to focus on cybersecurity. We went um, uh, approximately, oh, about a year, t took an extensive what we call a listening tour of our members uh, concerning the cybersecurity issue to find out what was most important to them and what they found to be their greatest challenges. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, we found that our members, um, despite what you may hear, um, uh, some perceptions that I have I've heard up on the Hill, our members are ready, willing, and ready and willing to make the appropriate investments in security. Um, they are not sitting back on their haunches <laughs> saying, we're not going to do anything about it. But their hesitation can be traced directly to their uncertainty about what are the so-called right investments. Because they're, and the most effective investments, and the most efficient use of limited resources that they have. So the incentives that you build in for the adoption of the cybersecurity framework um, don't necessarily have to be financial. They don't, although they're all important, they don't have to be necessarily financial. They can be more resource-based because of the constraints on resources, particularly in the smaller companies and medium-sized utilities. Um, so this, the incentives that we've heard um, discussed and were in the reports, such as the legal liability protections, um, protections from, I will throw in another one, from FOIA uh, concerns about information, privacy protections, grants, 
um, all of the, the contract references. Those are all important, um, and we're not minimizing them. Um, but we would like to focus more on meeting the resources um, uh, constraints uh, that our members have identified in terms of providing those incentives that are not necessarily financial. So the short-term incentives that we see um, is that you've got to, they understand the need for security, they understand the steps, or they, they are looking at the cybersecurity framework. What they don't understand, or what they need assistance with, I wouldn't, shouldn't say understand, what they need assistance with is how to implement the framework. Not necessarily what, but how. Um, because they have a, in fact, uh, a number of the, of the utilities that, that I spoke with said, we have, it's, it's not a lack of information. We have lots of information. We have information coming at us every day. We simply don't have the resources, the personnel, to sit at a computer and watch and, and assess all of the information coming into us. But we don't know which information is the most important and we should queue on. Um, so if in adoption of the cybersecurity framework, you need to make it easy and, to, and in, easy to institute appropriate security processes and procedures. So an incentive would be a simplified guide to quick and dirty approaches and practical application guidance to stop the bleeding, not necessarily uh, a prospective security uh, uh, measures, but to stop the bleeding as, as they occur now, because you see that there are a lot of, of reports of vulnerabilities and attacks and infiltrations of the, of the systems. Um, so with that as a short, in, in, as that, as a, as a, as a um, introduction, I would say one of the biggest incentives would be for government to establish a collaborative process between stakeholders, federal and state governments to provide attention and resources to reach national agreement on terms of art and conventions on a, both the federal and a national level, on a state level, to develop, pro, and, to develop and provide simple guidance on how to build secure systems. So you're not putting security on top of systems, but making them secure from the get-go. But they need guidance on that. Um, to define what, appropriate, what constitutes appropriate processes and measures that constitute compliance with the NERC SIP standards. Um, right now there is a debate about what constitutes adoption. Um, maybe there should be agreement that compliance with NERC SIP means that the, there are, is de facto or, or prima facie evidence of compliance with the, with the cybersecurity framework. But that agreement has to be reached. You've got to assist state and local governments to understand the practical things that they need to do right now so they don't make the situation any worse. One of the examples that we have was uh, a municipal utility was saying that they wanted to let an RFP for um, uh, certain security measures um, that they wanted to take. But the RFP process, because they're municipal, is public. So do you, and in order to be able to appropriately flesh out the RFP and, and for giving guidance as to what they're looking for um, and what they want to contract, what services they want to contract for, they would have to give a full explanation of their systems as they exist now. So th does that make sense? That doesn't make any sense, does it? So there has to be some kind of guidance for the state government so that they don't make the situation any worse and that you can address these issues. So the other issue that we saw, too, is that DHS, much to their credit, has a number of programs um, that are available um, and resources, technical assistance. I mean, we identified, uh, I mean, you, you talk, talked about sticks, you talked about taxi, CRISP, which is a, um, one of the programs that, that EEI is engaged in, CARMA, uh, the ECS, Enhanced Cybersecurity Programs. These are all great programs, but they all seem to be, that, that's a need that let's fill it with this program. But we would encourage some kind of coordination so there's a holistic approach to all of these programs. And there is better collaboration and communication with the smaller and medium-sized companies so that they understand what resources are available. I appreciated the question that was, that was posed the other, uh, previously to the previous panel about the term critical infrastructure. Most of these small and medium guys, I mean, if they're serving a community, a municipal electric utility is serving a community of 15,000, do they really consider themselves critical? Um, 
and do they feel as if they can avail themselves to all of the resources or they really kind of feel like they that those are for the big guys if you will um, so those are the short-term incentive is better collaboration so that there is really simple guidance for for people to for these asset owners um, particularly the small and medium-sized uh, um, entities to know what are the right investments to make. Long-term incentive, and this I think is, is one that is across the board, um, not only in terms of the cybersecurity framework, but also in terms of a lot of various national policies. There has to be government training, uh, government investment in programs, um, perhaps in a worker certification process, so that you really know that when you're hiring a cybersecurity professional, that they are really a cybersecurity professional. Um, so there has to be uh, some recognition of, a, of, a, of what the qualifications are uh, for being involved in that realm. One of the other issues that we saw that was a real challenge for utilities, and I think it's across the board too for businesses, is uh, the lack of um, qualified workforce um, in this area. Um, but in terms of the utility industry, there is a real lack there's an overall lack, but there's a real lack of, of qualified and trained uh, personnel that understand communication systems in the, in the utility realm. Um, those are specialized systems. Um, and so you have to get even more specialized, and there's a real dearth of, of, of personnel to fill all of the positions that are coming available because of the enhanced communications, advanced communication systems that are being employed by utilities. Um, what, and this is the final thing that I'll leave with you, um, what the overall long-term incentive would be a comprehensive and authoritative mapping of all of the regulations, standards, and requirements to identify the appropriate actions to be taken so that critical infrastructure owners and operators can invest once and have confidence that all the pertinent regulations have been met thereby directing resources where they are most effective and efficient and compliant, demonstrating the value of the right security investment and thereby making the business case. So, for example, our members comply with regulations from a number of federal agencies, um, including FERC and the NERC SIP standards for generation transmission and the large um, asset owners um, IOUs that are part of the bulk electric system, but also EPA with their water systems, with DOT with the natural gas pipelines, and with NRC with the nuclear power plants. So they have a myriad of regulations and many, for many of these they're combination companies. I mean they have a, a certain aspect to all of these. Municipal water companies um, are combined with, obviously it's local government, with municipal electric companies. So if they can make one investment that complies with all of the regulations, various regulations, that's much more efficient for them. A mapping will also provide the needed guidance to cooperatives so that, and smaller and medium-sized companies so that they have the confidence that they are, they are investing their limited resources and measures that actually improve their security posture. So in this case, they would be taking a page out of the book of their big brothers, if you will, the IOUs, because if the IOUs, if the mapping of their regulations that they've got to comply with mean that this type of security investment is the right one, they have confidence that they can follow that lead of their big brothers um, and are making the right investments um, with their limited resources. And they will not be faced with five years down the road, that wasn't the right investment, you've got to put more money into it. Especially this is also true with the cooperatives because all electric all the customers of a cooperative are members of the cooperative, so the money that they invest in these security investments, uh, in these security measures, are going to be reflected in the rates that they pay, and they've got to agree as members to make these investments. So if they have assurance that, the mem that the, they are making the right investments because of all of the compliance and mapping that has done, um, that would be a, be a huge incentive for them to get involved um, and, to, and to devote the resources um, in this area. I'm not suggesting that government should do the mapping itself, but instead set up a funding resource for the development of a mapping tool. Um, and, uh, you've got to find the experts and facilitate oversight. Much of the mapping has already been done, 
So working with the industry to determine how to use what is already done is what we are suggesting in terms of facilitating that mapping. Um, I wanted to bring up the issue too of disincentives um, because there are certain things that we, is, is, and I, the reason for my question with uh, Deputy Secretary Schneck before is a lack of confidence. You've got to instill the confidence um, of working with the federal and state government as trusted partners. Um, and that, unfortunately, it may not be um, telling the full story, but uh, that helps uh, the, the DHS IG report uh, kind of undermines that trust relationship. Um, so anything coming out of the government is going to have, why should I get involved? So you've got to build the trust. Um, we also, are, our disincentive is that the, the uh, framework becomes, adoption becomes an overzealous auditing regime, which actually takes resources away from actual security improvements. But the final one, and I think this is probably one of the huge disincentives that we see for uh, many of the companies, is that this, the, the cybersecurity framework becomes the full employment act for consultants. Um, you, you have this huge document and they don't know what to do with it. So they just say, I know we've got to do something, hire somebody to figure it out. So that's the last that I'll mention. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, let's take questions. Well, I have a question. Um, so, sorry, uh, we'll <laughs> go back to the audience in a second. Um, so, uh, David, actually, let me ask you a que two questions. Um, one that I think your members probably will appreciate, one that they, they won't. Um, <laughs> so, uh, first, if, um, you know, utilities are already so highly incented to, um, for, to invest in cybersecurity, uh, at least the investor-owned utilities, um, it sounds like there's some questions about smaller ones, uh, what, what is the potential value added of, of DHS and, and these programs? So I guess I would suggest the, the, the value added is um, to the degree that the framework provides, I'll say, answers and solutions as opposed to, um, I, and I'll just be extreme to make a point, as opposed to a, a regulatory club that is used to punish, but to the degree that, that there's carrots, tools, insight, and, in, and information that helps us all work smarter and more efficiently, we're there. We, I mean, we believe in partnerships. Our, our members are partnering today with, with uh, folks from DHS and DOE and the FBI and et cetera um, already, and we believe in information sharing and working together just a, as a base matter. So are there, but are there currently antitrust concerns or, or something that prevents uh, certain types of interactions that, that you think are, are necessary? Or at least would be helpful, I say, not necessary. So uh, one of the areas that, that we're looking for help in, and, and perhaps the, the guideline is, is not going to be the vehicle to provide this, is, is some liability protection such that um, if, if, the government, if the government provides uh, certain information to a utility, how does the utility defend itself against um, lawsuits either that it, the utility acted on the information that it received causing somebody to be unhappy with the results or for reasons that made sense did not take particular action in response to the information and there were negative outcomes and then you get sued for that as well. Going the other way, um, there may be times when the government is interested in information from utilities. How can that information be shared um, effectively with the government without creating additional liability? Um, actually, so that brings me to my second question about liability. Um, it seems to me that, uh, I mean, liability is one of the things that is, creates the right incentives, right? I mean, that you have potential liability. So wouldn't you know, reducing that liability or, or putting limits on it also reduce the incentives that the industry has to, uh, to invest in cybersecurity? Um, That's the question you won't like, by the way. <laughs> well, it, it, um, uh, I, I guess I would, I would go to my initial point, which is um, the industry is today, right now, highly, highly incented to make effective and efficient investments in cybersecurity. And I'll just tell you, 
um, cybersecurity and infrastructure uh, protection is uh, very much a topic that is happening at the, at the CEO level, in the boardrooms, in meetings of, of the utility CEOs when they get together. Um, so I, I frankly do not think that, that there's a lack of, I don't, I don't believe that there's a lack of engagement or a lack of organizations being incented right now today to invest in this space. Could I, can I also yes, add to please, that? I, the utilities, um, our member utilities, and as I say, we focus on the communications aspect. So cybersecurity obviously is, is front and center of, to, their, to their focus. Um, the, the utilities that we talk to um, are very concerned, uh, are very interested in providing and doing the right, understanding what the right security processes are in the development of a culture of security. It's not necessarily just the adoption of the framework, but it's, it's being able, and they understand very much that really electricity is the foundational service for the entire national economy, um, for the entire national security. I mean, without electricity, uh, how many of you saw the National Geographic special on the American blackout? We would question as to what the you know, the validity of, of, of that actually occurring, but you can see what the aftermath was. Um, and so they understand that, that their proper functioning and reliability and security is extremely important in terms of the national security, uh, in terms of everybody's lives, not just from a bottom, bottom line standpoint. So it, that, I think that they are already incented um, to do the, the proper security measures. The issue comes into where making sure that they understand what are the right investments to make. And so does some, can, why doesn't some of that information come from the bigger uh, utilities? Is it partly because, for example, Edison Electric is just electricity and, and your members are run the gamut of, of utilities? Or is there something more structural that um, keeps this information from flowing between the two? Are they simply not compatible because of uh, scale differences? Well, it's, I mean, let's take, it, take a look at NERC SIP, for instance. I mean, in NERC SIP, you have certain standards that are put into place, but how, you, how those standards are interpreted in terms depends on the auditor because there are no conventions. Um, there, are no, there are no accepted practices. Um, I think that there is going to be now, and it, it, that in part is driven by the diversity of, the, of the, the companies and the different communications networks that they have. Um, but the, the major point to be made is that if you can have agreement um, on the proper, um, on what to do and how to do it, um, that you can have economies of scale in terms of the technology. Many of the systems that are put into place right now are proprietary systems. And they're directed at, at compliance to a certain aspect of NERC SIP. That, that it probably is not the most efficient and effective way to institute a security program. The other thing that, that I would suggest is that um, there are naturally occurring communities that are involved in information sharing right now. So, so you do have, in today's world, you have electric utilities sharing information with other u utilities. You do have IOUs sharing information with co-ops and with, with munis. Mm -hmm. that, that is happening today. The other partnership that I would say is, is very uh, vibrant is is you have electric utilities sharing information with their natural gas counterparts, and EEI has a, has a close alignment with members of AGA, um, and, and to not as, not as great a degree, but, but INGA and others, sort of, if you think of it as concentric circles, sort of the farther you get out from your core area, I would say probably there's not tons of information sharing between the electric utilities and, say, water. I, right. There may be some, but it's it's not very it's not very vibrant because we don't see each other every day. Is there is there any evidence that the sharing has worked? Well, I I would say that there is evidence that the sharing has worked because it is continuing. It, it's continuing. Okay, let it's me ask another question. <laughs> is there any evidence that the information sharing has reduced incidents or loss? Loss events. I would say yes. Well, you know, you say, well, is there evidence? So show up with with right. certain documents. 
Um, I can tell you that that electric utilities do share information and, and uh, many of them are very active with the electric sector information sharing and analysis center, which its, its primary mission is to, in fact, promulgate information about emerging risks. And so, so one person at the ISAC sends a message that goes out to hundreds or thousands of utilities that says, be aware of this thing. Here's a signature. Here's, here's what this malware looks like. Okay, and now utilities have a tool with which to defend themselves. Yeah. So I would say yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, if I could just add, I would think the most effective, uh, the, the, the probably the most beneficial aspect of, of this information sharing going on is opening up the communications channels. Those have not been done. Those have to be exercised regularly. You have to develop relationships with people on the state and federal level as well as with your counterpart within the industry. Um, and I think exercises such were conducted by GridX with, with NERC. Um, with is a very, very important example, and it was a tremendous opportunity um, for those companies that participated in that to exercise their people and processes that they have in place to combat both a cyber event as well as in, com in combination with a physical event. Um, so I think exercises such as that, that's a great way of, of information sharing, but it's also a way for the, in for the company to bring back information so it can, uh, it can test itself. Um, and its internal processes. As, as um, uh, Deputy Secretary Schneck said, it's not necessarily technology, it's people. Um, so it's being able, yep, security is, is, is people and processes. So it's a, uh, exercises such as that, such as GridX, um, are a, a great example of what the, the industry is doing to improve itself, both from cross-communication channels, uh, opening them up, as well as internally in improving their own security posture. So I think there was a, there was a question, yes, there. Yeah, uh, forgive me, I, I, I was late, so uh, if I'm going over some of you guys already went over, I, I apologize. But um, I just had a question, uh, uh, it's kind of a follow-up to, to your investment question. A lot of people in the investment community are wondering just how meaningful a cyber framework will be um, from an investment perspective for firms, cyber firms. Um, you know, I guess in other words, uh, in, in your view, how, uh, how meaningful are the incentives in terms of driving incremental private sector spending on cybersecurity? Uh, do you think it's going to, do you think it's going to lead to a lot more uh, spending for, for, for network security firms, or excuse me, revenues for network security firms? Um, and, then, and then secondly, uh, do you have a sense of uh, where most of the critical infrastructure firms currently are in their spending cycle? In other words, do a lot of firms already have most of the basic measures in place? Um, or is there a lot of catch-up that would have to be done? So, uh, several questions there. I, I, think, I think I'd reiterate uh, Prudence's remark is that um, success is not uh, this becoming a full employment act for uh, vendors of consultants and technology. I, I, I think even, even DHS would, would agree with me that um, there's not a silver bullet. There's not just like one thing. You go out and you buy this one thing and all your problems are solved. I mean, that's, that's really not how life is. I, I think that the practical reality is that um, as, a, as a result of the framework that there will be some, there will be incremental investments in, in certain technology. But I think, I think the more important issue is, is something that Prudence said, and that is um, n not the beginning, but I'll say the continuation of a change in corporate culture su such that every employee of every member of a critical infrastructure company recognizes and realizes that they have an important role to protect the ongoing operation of their, of their, um, of their organization. W with respect to your question of, um, has all of the investment that is to be made in this area, is it all done or is it only the beginning? Uh, there are organizations across a, a spectrum. There are, there are organizations that are really leaning forward and in, in using a number of very advanced technologies and procedures and people and consultants and, and all kinds of things. And there are folks who are not as mature, okay? Um, so, so, there, there will be 
some additional investment in this space. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not able to say, well, okay, we, we expect to see security spending go up by X percent. I, I'm not sure that we're, we're ready to, to make that, make that, um, that view. John. Well, well, one way, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So one way to think about it is, depending on the incentives that are, are actually adopted, the extent to which it increased firms' costs. So one way to get them to spend more is to increase their cost of some accident happening, right? Because the firm is trying to balance two things, the cost of investment with the damage that would occur because of a lack of investment, like a data breach or something. So the more you're increasing their cost, their expected cost of that bad thing happening, the more you will induce them to invest more. So whether those extra costs come from forcing them to internalize whatever harm they impose on others or from straight up regulation, uh, you, you'll achieve that increase in investment. The, the trick, of course, is to not uh, overburden them, to get them to spend more than they should. And by should, I guess I mean a socially optimal level, which is the level which to minimizes overall cost. Um, uh, and, and so one way to think of the different kinds of investments or to analyze the different kinds of investments is to understand the different costs that they would actually impose on firms. Can I, can, in terms of the utility sector, there's a little bit of a different uh, uh, take on the utility sector because their technology refresh rate is not what it is uh, in the, in the uh, economy as a whole. I mean, you have equipment that they have had in service for 30, 40, 50 years. It's still working. They don't see any reason to replace it. Um, however, if, if there is a technology, if they, they're reaching the end of their useful lives. So I would agree with David that has all the investment been made? No, absolutely not. But there should be some guidance provided to them that when they do replace that equipment, because some of them are analog, they're not even in the digital world yet, that when they do replace them, they have confidence that they will be, have the, the appropriate security measures built into that equipment already. Not, they don't have to bolt it on. That the security that they are undertaking within that system itself is going to be compliant with the standards and adaptable to the standards that may be coming down the pike in terms of mandatory standards in terms of the electric industry. So, so we're, we're about so to the bump up against the, uh, sorry. but get kicked sorry. out of the room, I, I think. So, um, John, if you just want to wrap up what, yeah, what you were, I, I <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, please uh, help us all thank the panelists. <laughs> yeah. And with that, let me just say that uh, I want to again thank you on behalf of the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy for coming today. If you are like me, you have more questions now than when you arrived, and it's not because the panelists didn't collectively do a marvelous job of giving us information, but that this is a discussion that is just simply going to continue for a while. We look forward to being part of it. We want to invite you to subsequent events that we will hold and welcome your interaction with the Georgetown Center. So thank you very much for coming. <laughs>